Father, this morning we praise you because you are a God who has seen us and loved us and rescued us through Jesus. And this morning we're here to worship you. And Lord, we want to surrender to you. Because as we yield our hearts and our lives and our minds to you, you set us free, you lift us up, and you lead us to life. So, Father, this morning we simply invite you to speak into our lives. Each and every one of us yields uh, our mind to you, that your truth would penetrate and teach us your word. Teach us your wisdom, that we might walk as sons and daughters of the living God. And, and Father, let us just sense your spirit as he moves in this room to, to call us into life. And we pray all this in the name of the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. Luke 16 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we're continuing our Just Jesus series. We spent the, the, this year looking at the life of Jesus, listening to his words, uh, seeing his actions, following how he treats people and what he says so that we can learn to follow him better. And, uh, and so today is uh, Luke 16. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They look a lot like this one. Turn to page 1041 and you will find Luke 16 and be able to follow along as we look at the scriptures today. And by the way, if you need a Bible, you want to read God's Word, but you don't have a Bible, then take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and be able to read it because we know if you read it, it will change your life. Uh, hey, just a note before we dive into the message, uh, we've got a, a mission team in Thailand uh, getting ready to leave, getting ready to come home uh, as we speak, and uh, they've been there for a, a little over a week, six of them on a medical mission trip, and uh, working with a, a full-time missionary physician that we help to support uh, through our, our gifts to the Southern Baptist Mission Program, and, uh, and they've been going doing free medical clinics in villages uh, throughout the country uh, this week. And, uh, uh, and just uh, people would come and they would do, uh, you know, just pretty cursory medical checks. They have a little pharmacy that travels with them, handing those things out. We've been helping do that. But every person who comes to that clinic gets to hear the gospel. And Thailand as a nation is less than 1% Christian. So a lot of these people have never heard the story of Jesus at all. And this week, I got the report last night, this week uh, 20 people prayed to receive Christ as Savior through those efforts of that mission team. And yeah, celebrate that. Because, you know, we're all about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and we do that here, but I want you to know we do that throughout the world as well, and, uh, and so I just wanted to share that good news with you. Hey, what is it uh, that gets your attention? What does it take to get your attention? What grabs you? What focuses you? What draws you in? Uh, is it money? Does money get your attention? The possibility of earning it, of getting it, of making some of it? Or is it an attractive person walking by? Does that get your attention? So you try to look without looking like you're looking so that your spouse doesn't like elbow you really hard or go, hey, what? What gets your attention? Is it free food? Does that get your attention? Yeah, there's, there's some in every crowd. It doesn't matter how old you are. You're like, free food? I'm going to go. I bet some of you are like always at those things they invite you to for the retirement planning or whatever. I'm just going to go and eat their food. I don't care what they say. I'll eat their food and walk out. I don't, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's big events. You know, you like the big event. You know, the, the big football game or, hey, the election's coming up. That gets your attention. Or, or maybe something really significant like Brad and Angelina splitting up. Hey, for some of you, maybe. What gets your attention? Is it something more serious like getting served with divorce papers? Are your children struggling? You know, the one thing that I think always gets us to pay attention is death. Because we can't ignore it. It always interrupts. It, it, it always invades our lives. It's never convenient. And today, Jesus wants our attention. And so he told a story about two dead guys. And he told the story to a bunch of, of wealthy religious elites, a group of people called the Pharisees, who uh, most of the people in Jesus' day saw the Pharisees as the most holy, the most righteous, the most religious, the people who were devoted to following God in every aspect of their lives as they understood it. And Jesus is talking to them because, quite honestly, these are some guys that have irritated him. 
they, they kind of ticked him off. And, and uh, we're going to pick up in verse 19 in a minute, but I want to look back in, in Luke 16, beginning of verse 14. It, it tells us a little bit about the context of the passage we're going to read. It says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things that Jesus had been teaching, and they ridiculed Jesus. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And then he tells this story. Pick up verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And then he said, I beg you, Father, to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, this was a shocking story that Jesus told to the people that were listening. Again, we're talking about the Pharisees, these religious elites who loved money and who cared more about what people thought than what God thought. And Jesus is talking to them, and he tells a story, and it shocked them. First of all, it shocked them because they believed that if you were wealthy, you were blessed by God, and if you were poor, you were cursed by God. And so the, the outcome of this story uh, in itself shocked them. Here's a rich guy, blessed by God. Here's a poor guy, cursed by God. What happens? The poor guy goes to be with Abraham, and the rich guy goes to hell. That is not how they understood life. That is not how they saw things. And so Jesus was shocking them, going, hey, pay attention. Things are not like you think they are. You're exalting things that God thinks is terrible. You're celebrating stuff that God thinks is sin. And so he wanted to get their attention because they needed to hear these truths and we need to hear these truths. So does Jesus have your attention today? Here's what I want us to do. I want us to walk through this story and, and look at the things it's teaching us because it applies to our lives as well as to, their, to that audience. So uh, journey with me on this. First of all, this story tells us a picture of life. A picture of life. There's two men who are living contrasting lives. One is wealthy, he's comfortable, he's privileged, and let's face it, he's selfish. Okay? It's all about him. The other is poor, disabled, because they had to lay him at the gate, so somebody was carrying him. He was begging. He was helpless. I mean, this guy was desperate because he was hoping for the crumbs that are falling from the table of the rich guy. Hey, if crumbs fall off your table and you don't have a dog that eats them, uh, what, what do you do with the crumbs? You sweep them up and you throw them away. This guy wanted the trash. He wanted to be able to eat the trash off this rich guy's table. And... Uh, and that's who these guys were. So which one do you relate to in the story? Because most of us, when we read a story, even in Scripture, we kind of kind of relate to somebody in the story. We kind of pick somebody and go, yeah. And, and it's really easy for us to read this and go, yeah, that selfish rich guy got what he deserved. Because we never see ourselves as wealthy and selfish. Pretty much none of us look in the mirror in the morning and go, 
you are a rich, selfish guy. And, and, and yet, you know, we're, we're kind of going, hey, I, my house is small, my, my car is old, I got medical bills, I'm on a fixed income, I'm just barely getting by. So we don't see ourselves in the story so easily. And here's the problem. We live in a wealthy nation. We are, by all accounts, wealthy people. Every one of us in this room, I know some of you are going like, I, I don't have much. You don't have much compared to the people who have more than you because you're looking in the wrong direction. The reality is, is as people who live in the United States of America, we have more money, possessions, comfort, and security than 98% of the world. We got more. Guys, we are blessed. As Americans, we have won the lottery of history. Think about that. We, we've got it all. We've, we've got comfort. We've got security. We've, we've got freedom and, and stuff. But we're always looking at the 1% who have more than us. Okay, and maybe you don't have much at all. So you're looking at the 1.9% who have more than you. You're like, well, I'm really poor. You know, I don't, you know, there's a lot of people that have more stuff than me. Well, yeah, look at the rest of the world. Like, take, for instance, a house in Mozambique. Okay, this is a typical house in Mozambique. I took this picture when I was there uh, about a month ago, and it's made out of mud and grass. And people live in that. And you know what? They don't just live in it and feel when, man, my house stinks. They, they're thankful that they have a house. And, and the floor is dirt. There's no electricity. There's no running water. There's no plumbing in this house. Animals can just like wander in the house. There's not even a door on it. What's the point of having a door on it when you can walk through the wall? <laughs> Think about it. You know, don't tear my walls down. I just don't have, have a door. They might have a, a curtain that hangs in the way. So that means, just, you know, the critters can just come in, including the bugs. And they got bugs. Let me just tell you something. See, that, that's their house. And, and that's just an average house in Mozambique. People all over the world are living like that. And, and we have so much more, and we just need to be aware of that. So, for the purpose of hearing Jesus, maybe we should listen from the perspective of the nameless rich guy in the story. Just a thought. Uh, and by the way, if you want to live a happier life, be thankful for the blessings in your life because we are so blessed. Um, two men, two very different lives. What happens to both of them? They die. Story is about two dead guys, so it's not that hard to, to figure out, they, you know. And, and by the way, that's going to happen to all of us as well. It, it's, it's just going to happen. In fact, Scripture tells us it's going to happen. Hebrews chapter 9, it is appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment. By the way, the word man there is, is gender inclusive. It's for everybody. It's appointed unto everybody once to die and then to face judgment. I know some of you grew up like I did. Evangelical churches, they're talking about Jesus coming back, and, and they use words like this, if I die. Here, let's just go ahead and, and frame this. The odds are not in our favor. Okay? It, you know, you may still be holding on to that hope that Jesus is going to come back, and if he does, awesome! But go ahead and prepare for the reality that it's kind of our appointment once to die. Because, you know, they were telling me Jesus is coming any moment when I was 17. Getting a whole lot closer to the other end of the life spectrum, if you know what I mean. So... We know this is true, so we can and should be ready for that day whenever that day happens. Now, we don't know when we're going to die, because if we knew when, it would totally freak us out, right? But we know that we're going to die. And since we love our families, two thoughts, life insurance and estate planning. If you've got kids at home, life insurance. See, someone's reminding us to have life insurance right there. It's what it's for. And estate planning, because you don't want your families to fight over the stuff when you're gone, because you love your families. So, first of all, we see a picture of life, and then we see in the story a picture of eternal life, and I should say death. Because Lazarus dies, and he joins Abraham. It, Abraham is the father of faith. He's the father of the faithful. And, and so people who are faithful are, are being drawn to that place where Abraham is. The Apostle Paul uses that picture a lot in, in his writings. And, and so Lazarus goes to be with the father of faith, and the rich guy dies, and he's in torment and in pain. He's in anguish. And this is a picture of what we call heaven and hell. 
Now, it's not trying to describe what heaven and hell are going to be like in detail. It's what Jesus is trying to tell us is that eternity is real. Eternity is real. It's appointed a man wants to die and then judgment and then eternity. And your eternity is either going to be one of life and joy and peace or it's going to be one of pain and torment and suffering. Now, a lot of people right now in, in our culture kind of believe in this thing called nihilism, which is they believe you live and then you die and then nothing. And a lot of Christians have adopted a, a form of that. They kind of believe that, well, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you go to heaven. And if you don't follow Jesus, then you just die and nothing. And the problem with that is it's not biblical. And our very first statement of faith, if you will, the essentials is this. We believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And so we're going to let our views be shaped by Scripture, not the other way around. And Jesus is saying, look, eternity is real. Heaven and hell are real. And everyone who dies without Christ, their reality is eternal pain. So eternity is real, and Jesus is trying to tell us that eternity is permanent. Permanent. You can't cross over either way. There's a chasm fixed. Uh, once you're there, you're there. And that means the choices that we make in this life have eternal consequences. The choices that we make in this life have eternal ramifications. Uh, that's why the mission of Calvary is so important. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus because the choices in this life that they make are going to have eternal consequences. Now, the story tells us that eternity is real. It tells us that eternity is permanent, permanent, but it doesn't tell us how we get to eternal life, how we get to heaven. So let me take the words of Jesus to explain this, because if you just read the story, you might think being rich means you end up in hell and being poor and sick and disabled means you get to go to heaven. And that's not the message Jesus is trying to convey. So what did Jesus say is the way to have eternal life? Well, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, he said, follow me. Follow me. In Luke chapter 9, he expanded that. He said, if anyone's going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. In John chapter 3, Jesus spoke extensively about eternal life. And, and, and a lot of you know part of this passage. John 3, beginning in verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Eternal life is not based on your economic status your religious affiliation. It's not based on your good deeds. Eternal life is connected directly to Jesus. Believing in Jesus, following Jesus, surrendering to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And then in the midst of this picture of life and this picture of eternal life, there is a request to warn. If you're not familiar with this story, this might have struck you as, as really odd. Because it's the thing that kind of stands out. Verse 27. This is after he's requested uh, to be comforted and been told no. He says, Then I beg you, Father, to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Send Lazarus to warn my brothers. I don't want them to end up here. And Abraham says, it won't work. Look, your brothers, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe someone who rises from the dead. Now, at this point, I believe Jesus is referencing himself. He's addressing religious elites. 
who are mocking him, who are ridiculing him, who are making fun of him because they don't agree with what Jesus is teaching. And yet these are the people who study Moses and the prophets. Don't you think the guys who are studying Moses and the prophets the prophets who are telling about the Messiah who is to come, and there they are standing in the presence of the Messiah who is God in the flesh. Don't you think that if they really were listening to Moses and the prophets, they would have had a clue about Jesus? It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And so Jesus is talking to them about them, and he's saying, look, you're not listening to Moses and the prophets. You think you're listening to Moses and the prophets because you're trying to live your life according to the law that's there, but you're missing it. And when Jesus rose from the dead, suddenly all those religious elites that had been, you know, conspiring against Jesus and hating Jesus, suddenly they realized, wow, he really is the Messiah and we need to repent and believe in him, right? No, that's not what happened. It, this is incredible. When, when we read the pages of Scripture, Matthew 28 has this account uh, beginning in verse 11. This is right after the women have found the tomb empty and the angels have appeared to them and and Jesus has appeared. It says this, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. The guards at the tomb went and told the chief priests that Jesus had risen from the dead. And when they, the chief priests, had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, uh, because for a soldier to fall asleep at his post was punishable by death. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Unbelievable. The people who represented God to the nation of Israel, who made their life studying the law and the prophets, had an eyewitness account come to them and and say, hey, look, here's what happened. Angels showed up. Stones moved by themselves. There was light. Jesus walked out of the tomb. We're freaking out. What do you want us to do? And they said, here's some hush money. Tell a lie. How did they do that? How in the world do they not fall to their knees and go, Jesus, is? we're sorry we crucified you. We're sorry you're the Son of God. You're the Savior. You're the Messiah. How are they not throwing a party instead of covering it up? Wow. They didn't believe even one raised from the dead. You see, we can present truth. We can speak the truth in love. We can model a truth-based life, but we cannot convince anyone that Jesus is the Son of God. If they don't believe the truth, even the miraculous won't convince them. And that means that we are responsible for our lives. We are responsible for our words, our actions, to invite people, to love people, to serve people, uh, to try to introduce them to Jesus. But we are not responsible for their decisions. We simply do what we can, but they have to decide. They have to respond. They have to listen to the truth and allow it to penetrate their hearts. Finally, let's look at application to life. Application to our lives. What what do we get out of this that directly applies to me and you? Well, here's a couple of thoughts. First of all, don't live a selfish life. Don't live a selfish life. It's kind of obvious, but let me just point out that the rich, selfish guy was the bad guy in the story. Okay? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the bad guy in any Jesus stories. It's not, not, never ends well for them, and I don't want to be him. So uh, we don't want to be selfish, so be grateful and be generous. Be grateful and be generous. Be grateful for what you have. We've already talked about how blessed we are uh, just being uh, residents of this country. Uh, So thank God for the blessings that he has given you. Thank God for the blessings that other people bless you with, because all of us are amazingly blessed. Open your eyes and see that. Practice gratitude until praise and thanksgiving are a natural part of your life. And folks, we have to practice gratitude because we are not naturally grateful people. We are naturally selfish people, and so we think we deserve more. And so practicing saying thank you to God and to everyone else will 
break that habit, and it will change our dynamic. And by the way, it will be obedient to God because Scripture says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of Christ, God wants you to be thankful. So be grateful and be generous. Be generous. By the way, Scripture does not condemn having money. It's okay to have money. We're just told to share it and to invest it in God's kingdom. The Apostle Paul uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 wrote this. By the way, if you want to read a great passage that kind of speaks to real practical things, read 1 Timothy 6. It deals a lot with money and and how we're supposed to approach that. But towards the end of that, that chapter, Paul says this. As for the rich in this present age, we've kind of already established that we're all wealthy, okay? Because we live in America. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What does generosity look like? We bless people. And we bless the kingdom of God. We bless people and we bless the kingdom of God. Now, again, I already mentioned that when we look in the mirror, none of us really see ourselves as rich or selfish. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We judge everyone else, but we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. So I might think I'm generous. Guess what? It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. You know what matters? What God thinks. See, so here's the deal. When I get to the end, I don't want to find out that I thought I was generous and God thought I was selfish. So how do we know if we're generous or not? Well, we use God's standard rather than our standard to evaluate our generosity. What's God's standard? Well, God asks his people, followers of Christ, to give him 10%. It's a tithe. He asks us to give him 10%. And and that's where he begins measuring generosity from. And so look at your life, look at your, your, your bank statements, all that kind of stuff, and figure out, am I being generous according to God, not according to me? So, don't live a selfish life. Be grateful, be generous. Secondly, be prepared for eternity. We've already talked about this. It's appointed in a man wants to die and then judgment. We, I'm assuming, we want to go to heaven. So, do you want to go to heaven? <laughs> Great, 10 of you do. That's awesome. <laughs> I probably got that answer wrong. Do we want to go to heaven? Oh, okay. Well, good. I just was wondering there for a second. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the one joke that I, I tell. Okay, so here it is. I don't tell jokes well, so this is, this is it. Preacher is, is preaching about heaven, and he says, do we want to go to heaven? And like you, everybody says, yes, and he, except for one guy right here on the front row. So he says it again, do we want to go to heaven? And everybody says, yes, except for this guy around the front row. And he goes, sir, are you telling me that you really don't want to go to heaven? And the guy goes, well, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but it sounded like you're getting up a party to go right now. (laughs) Um, Okay, we want to go to heaven. So have you experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know that he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he died on the cross for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life? If the answer is no, then today don't leave here without settling that because we want you to be prepared for eternity. We don't want you to miss out. You know, and if there's a question about the belief part, we want to talk with you about that. If there's a question about the commitment part, we want to talk with you about that because we want you to experience that life-changing relationship with Christ. Now, if your answer to those is yes, have you told anyone about your decision? You know, or is it your just little secret? I've been coming here and I made the decision, but I'm not telling anybody. We would love to know. Stop by one of the connection centers, grab one of the pastors and just go, hey, I've made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate with you. And then if you've made that decision to follow Jesus, have you been baptized? See, baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is your declaration to the world that Jesus has changed your life and you're a new creation in him. And and it's being obedient to Christ. And as we walk in obedience to Christ, he blesses us even more. And and so what's stopping you? Because we will baptize you just about anywhere, anytime if there's a crowd and water. You want to get baptized in any service, just tell us the date. We'll, We'll make it happen. 
We're not embarrassed about that because we want to help you be obedient to Christ. So be prepared for eternity. We care about your eternity because, as I've said before, Calvary exists to lead people to Jesus Christ. I beg you, be, be ready for eternity. And then finally, warn those you love while you can. Hell is real, and it is not a party place to hang out with friends. It is a place of torment and pain, sorrow and agony, of eternal regret. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're not going to experience that. But God has given you influence. He's given you influence with family, with friends, with people in life who respect and trust you. What are you doing to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Don't miss the opportunity. Invite them to come to church. They don't live here, fine. Write them a letter. Tell them your story. Encourage them to, to make that decision to follow Jesus. You go, I don't write well. Fine, grab an iPad, make a video. Okay, look, you got grandkids. They'll do it for you. <laughs> Tell the story. Send it to someone. And, and let me just be real blunt. If, if you've got kids living at home, the greatest trust of influence that God ever gives any of us is our children. You have the power to lead them toward God. So let faith be part of your life so that they can see it. Pray with your kids. It doesn't matter if you don't pray well. They'll teach you because Miss Julie's teaching them. Have them here at, at church as, on a regular basis so that they get to experience the teaching. By the way, don't you love the fact that your kids want to come to church? I did not grow up that way. Just my testimony, Okay. Church was not fun, and, and, and so we, we want the experience to be great for your kids. We work hard at that. Your teenagers, have them at youth group. You know, encourage them on a weekly basis to, to be studying and learning and growing and serving. Make it a priority to get them to go to camp, to, to go on mission trips. Heck, take them on mission trips yourself. As a family, point them to God. Grandparents, if, if you love being a grandparent and you love your grandkids, you know, you don't have that direct influence anymore, but you have a tremendous amount of influence in your life to encourage them toward Christ. You can be the one who removes the obstacles of cost. Grandparents, and I am one now, so I can throw this down. Let's just go, hey, you know, we're, we'll pay for you to go to camp. We want you to go to camp. We will pay for that to happen. Don't tell me that you can't afford it because that, that's not going to be an excuse that stands up. You want to go on a mission trip? I will bankroll you to go on a mission trip. You can't take them yourselves? Fine. Then pay for them to go. You don't have grandkids that will do it? There's some volunteer grandkids in our student ministry right now that will sign up to be your grandkids. You see, let's take this seriously. It's a matter of eternal life and death. Jesus warned us. I hope today that he has your attention. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us beyond words. Thank you for your amazing grace that has set us free from the bondage of sin and death and hell, that we don't have to be afraid of the t torment and pain uh, of everlasting punishment. But God, we want to be used by you to, to lead others out of that, that desperation. So show us how to do that. Show us how to live lives that are grateful and generous and hopeful for you. But most of all, Jesus, thank you for loving us enough to sacrifice yourself so that we could become sons and daughters of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.